Welcome to Policy on Demand, I'm Rohit Kumar. The use of ESG as an umbrella term for topics ranging from investment strategies to corporate social responsibility has led to misperceptions and at times controversy about whether focusing on certain risks and opportunities violates corporate duties to investors. Matt DiGiuseppe, Managing Director in PwC's Governance Insight Center, joins us to discuss corporate challenges and boardroom concerns around ESG. Matt, welcome. It's great to be here. So Matt, activist investors, environmental groups, and others have challenged companies to do more to combat climate change. But why is it important for directors to consider both sides of the ESG debate? So that's actually a really great place to start the conversation because you've already conflated ESG and climate, which is really easy to do, as you sort of said in the open, right? It means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. At its core though, ESG is, around, is focused on sort of identifying long-term uh, business opportunities, mitigating the risks associated with them, and the board's oversight of that whole process, right? Which is just the same as any sort of other element of, of corporate strategy. And climate can be part of that discussion. The issue is, is that, you know, and I'd argue every company will eventually probably be impacted by climate change, but the d duration and the impact of that sort of element is going to vary drastically. Right. And so boards really need to focus on identifying what are the guideposts and monitoring mechanisms that management teams are using so that when those risks emerge, they can be mitigated. And more importantly, you know, the board can challenge management on how they're taking advantage or, or looking for those opportunities that, that might exist. Um, but I mean, I know this is a, a nuanced answer to, to some degree um, and sort of hinges on the idea that we can put some of the rhetoric behind us. I'm curious though, from your experience, this is one of those elements that we were talking before, where the climate is, is hard. Do you think it's even possible for management teams to really move past that, that rhetorical element of the climate discussion? I mean, I think there's, there's certainly a fair bit of politics involved in this, especially right now in this political moment. Um, generally speaking, I think the path forward um, at least for those who are sort of approach this with a degree of skepticism, at least in terms of the elected uh, official population, is to make sure that there is a sort of market-driven rationale behind this, that this is not just engaging in politics for the sake of engaging in politics or currying favor with one side of the political aisle or the other, which is how some uh, certainly elected officials have portrayed it and see it. Uh, but those same officials, right, are will be very responsive to a, no, no, I'm not doing this as a political exercise or as a, you know, a signaling statement um, or whatever, but there's a real market reason for it. Either I have investors that are interested in this or I have a business case for it or the long-term sustainability of the operation or ultimately I'm going to be affected as an ent entity by climate and I need to mitigate that risk either directly in terms of mitigate the harm or do something to sort of mitigate the global risk of this thing happening and I, everyone does their little part and we all kind of pull together. So I think there is a path, but I've not, admittedly, I've not yet seen uh, sort of companies really effectively engage in that space. I think they're still using some of the old rhetoric, and what you're finding is that old rhetoric uh, lands poorly with at least roughly half of Capitol Hill at the moment. Right, it sort of goes back to that previous idea of the goal was to have data out there and a goal, right? No one really cared what the goal was, just have a goal out there, and sort of today you see much more of that transition to, have a plan and a sort of communication style and, and story that connects it back to the fundamental business. Right, yeah. It's it not just be, sort of meeting the moment. It needs right? to be more robust than I have a goal. Well, right. you need to have a rationale for the goal, you have an explanation and why this matters to the business, why it matters to the investor community and all of that. It's gotta be a little bit more fulsome than maybe it started um, initially. I, I wanna pivot a little bit because various state attorney generals have raised concerns about how ESG factors like climate are used by asset managers in proxy voting process, by pension plan managers when making investment decisions, and in financial institutions, um, lending decisions, especially in the energy sector. How have these concerns affected investment in the ESG space? Yeah, I mean, this is a time when that comes up, right? It, it's proxy season, you know, adjacent where there are votes on these issues. It's on the ballot, so to speak. Um, and, you know, what I, one thing I think we have to understand is despite sort of all of that discussion, the flows consider, continue to be there in terms of investors aligning their assets with sort of a lot of these products, concepts and ideas. I think that's because the 
idea of using pr climate or really sustainability more broadly in proxy voting decisions, uh, investment decisions, lending decisions, insuring decisions, it's actually not that new of an idea. Right. I think back to sort of when ESG was emerging as a common trend, and that was just like 2004. Right. So it's not not sort of in the distant past. I was talking to a portfolio manager about this concept and he looked at me and said, you mean management quality? That's always been part of the way that I do my investing. And so I, I think that, you know, the concept of ESG and management quality, the fact that they're so close is why as we have you know more data, we're starting to see that ESG aligned products actually do perform at least on par with their traditional peers, right? The, the evidence around sort of those that perform poorly is generally linked to when you take a myopic approach to the issue, right? So if you look at just climate change in your investment thesis, or if you look at just climate change plus maybe one or two of those other topics, then you're not accounting for the fact that these impacts are going to be sometimes indirect and you know, going back to our opening, the duration matters, right? So even before you were sort of seeing this pushback, you were hearing from investors talking about shades of green and shades of brown as a way of um, addressing the fact that you can't sort of take a black and white approach to this issue if you're going to actually achieve the ultimate goal, right? Which for anyone that's engaged in investing is to produce long-term sustainable returns, right? And I would argue, you know, proxy voting wouldn't have evolved, investing wouldn't have evolved the way it has, lending, insuring, but none of that would happen if at the end of the day, the people who have a fiduciary duty to their clients didn't believe that this would ultimately result in returns. Um, the problem is, again, so if we get back to that duration question, I'm curious for you, sort of, from a policy perspective, the constituencies that we're hearing from are sort of disconnected with, you will, from the impacts because of that duration question. I'm curious if there are sort of analogous situations out there that we might look to to understand sort of how to navigate through this, this element. Yeah, I mean, there are analogies out there, unfortunately, yet none of them have been successful, right? I mean, you think about like, the federal budget picture, right? The long-term debt burden that we saddled future generations with. We're not very good at sort of thinking about, this is a long-term problem, I need to endure some short-term pain, mm -hmm. right, to get there. Uh, so the deficit and the debt is sort of like the, the one that sort of leaps off the page at me. But there are other examples. Our immigration policy is, uh, no one likes our current immigration policy. There are different views about why the immigration policy is not working, but that's also sort of a long-term investment in the human capital of the country. So. Yeah. Yes, uh, you know, it's it's unfortunate. It's actually very similar to the way in which like, I know I shouldn't eat this cheeseburger because it is bad for my long-term health, but ooh, it is really delicious right now. And that's a problem for 10, 15 years from now, which is, you know, to some degree why we have an obesity crisis, right? Because the near-term decision is really gratifying. The long-term consequence is attenuated, and even if it's really bad, we're not well-wired for this. And that's, right. I think, part of the challenge is the, the disconnect between the tough decision today and the long-term benefit versus the easy decision today and the long-term harm being so down the road and attenuated, and in this case, perhaps generations that don't yet you know, fully exist. And so it's really hard. We're just not well wired to prioritize that interest against our near-term preferences. Right, I mean, kind of the same way that no business executive kind of operates their business to engage in political discourse, right? That's generally not, not a right. winning approach, but I think sort of coming back to what you were saying at the opening, right, the idea that linking these issues to the long-term success of the organization and delivering for investors, stakeholders, and, and sort of the broader community on that concept of businesses doing well ultimately benefit more than just their investor society more broadly, right? And grounding your decision making in that element, I think is a great way to sort of navigate some of that. Yeah, it actually leads me to the last question I wanted to ask you, which is, yeah. you know, as companies come under greater pressure to provide ESG disclosures, the information they publish and the story they tell has in some cases kind of been conflated to assume that those companies have an agenda. Why has this become an area of concern in some boardrooms? It's the idea that it's easy to point to sort of the disclosures that are meant to meet, to your point, what investors or other stakeholders are asking you can easily be presented as having an agenda. But And that's why I think it goes back to what you were saying, doing a little bit more, right? So that you explain why those elements that you're addressing are contributing to long-term success is really the answer there, right? Doing that exercise, not just to meet the disclosure requirements, but to tell the story. Thanks, Matt, for joining me today. It's been a great conversation. Yeah, I've really enjoyed it. I look forward to doing it again.
And thank you for joining us on this episode of Policy on Demand.